Welcome to recover an RSA private key from a TLS session with perfect forward secrecy in South Seas CDF with Marco Ortiz. Before we begin, a few brief notes. Stop by the business hall located in Bayside AB during the day and for the welcome reception from 5.30 to 7 p.m. tonight. The Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on level three. Join us for the Pony Awards in Mandalay Bay, BCD at 6.30 p.m. Thanks for putting your phone on vibrate. It makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore the ringing while you wait for your voicemail to pick it up. And with that, we welcome our speaker. Thank you, Caroline. Welcome, everybody. Uh, that is a really big audience. Uh, my name is uh, Marco Tisi. I am senior penetration tester. And I really love buffer over for vulnerability, and I adore exotic bugs like that one that I am going to introduce in this speech. Uh, another bit of information about me. We are, uh, now we are approximately here, but I'm coming from here, and this is Sicily. There is a nine hours uh, jet lag, so if I, look, uh, if I look affected by this glacier, you know why. So, about the topic. As I told you, I really like exotic vulnerability and retrieving a RSA private key just by sniffing the TLS traffic or interacting with the TLS service looks quite exotic to me. And it is done via a side, ch a side channel attack which is 100% reproducible. So, what about the roadmap? I will be giving you uh, an historical introduction about this vulnerability showing very soon uh, a demo. Afterwards, we will cover uh, more detail about the attack. And finally, a second demo is shown. And at the end will be the time for greetings and questions, if any. So let's start from an historical introduction about the problem. Exactly 20 years ago, Harian Lestra wrote a theoretical memo by warning that when RSA CRT is used for the calculation of digital signature and uh, an hardware fault take place during the computation of the signature, actually, um, this, triggers, this condition can, uh, can trigger a, a series of events leading to the private key leakage. The RSA CRT is basically an optimization for the calculation of digital signature. And from now on, we will define, we will refer to this attack as the Lenstra attack or the RSA CRT attack. So um, for this topic, it's very important to give a brief introduction about how RSA works, so a brief introduction about public key encryption, and especially, it is very important to cover the concept of digital signature. With RSA, we uh, own a couple of keys. We freely distribute our public key uh, so that someone can use it to send us an encrypted message. And we use our private key that, as the name suggests, must be kept secret to decrypt that message. And the private key is not only used for uh, decrypting something, but also to uh, sign something. And actually, signing is the action to generate a digital signature. To oversimplify, you can see it as an encryption operation. And in this case, conversely, the recipient uses our public key to verify the correctness of the signature. And to oversimplify again, you can see it as a decryption operation. So during the uh, Lestra memo and later on, uh, somebody conjectured that the same attack was also effective against smart card if the attacker could actually artificially inject uh, hardware faults during the computation of RSA signature. For example, by means of radiations, uh, abnormal voltage, or uh, um, uh, CPU overheating, so with heating and things like that. In 2001, 
sorry. I'm going, okay. In 2001, two researchers actually discovered an attack against the open PGP format uh, by exploiting the same principle um, described by Lenstra formally. Basically, if the attacker could, could get the, the archive containing the encrypted private key, tampering with it in a certain manner, and subsequently capturing a uh, digital signature, basically, basically he or she could derive the private key of server. And until that moment, it was believed that the, the attack was possible only if the attacker had physical access to the target device or local access to the system. Only by the end of 2015, so very recently, uh, Florian Weimar from Red Dot explained why the Lenstra attack brings remote impacts and implications. But unfortunately, together with his white paper, uh, he didn't provide any tools or proof of concept, and I will try to fill up this gap during my speech. So, uh, normally during a TLS session, what is revealed is the public key of server when it sends the, uh, the, the, the public key inside the server certificate to the client. But sometimes it, it is also possible to retrieve the private key beyond, uh, without going beyond that red line. So I mean in the preliminary step, in the prelim preliminary phase of the TLS and the shake, before encryption and anti-tampering countermeasures take place. To do that, we uh, require three preconditions that, as we will see later, are not so difficult to happen in, uh, in real life. So basically, we require the presence of RSA signature, which is generated with the RSA CRT optimization. It must be applied from values that the attacker knows in plain text. And of course, it must be faulty. I mean, it must, must be generated in a, in a wrong way by the server. What if the attack is successful? So basically the uh, private key, the server private key leaks. As an attacker, we can impersonate the real server or device. And of course, we can place any middle, many in the middle attacks uh, without alerting the legitimate client. And from that to this, it makes the difference when an attack is underway. Now, demo faster server. And because I feel brave, I want to give you a live demo. I want to show you the effect of the Lenstra attack before to continue with the technical stuff. So basically, I have created a tool called High Voltage uh, that when the three preconditions that I shown before, uh, I shown briefly, are met, it is able to recover the private key. So in my virtual machine, I deployed to uh, two different versions of OpenSSL. Uh, one, one of this version that we will call the good one has been actually downloaded by the default repository. And the other one that we will call the bad one has been patched in a way that uh, uh, RSA digital signature, a faulty RSA digital signature, is injected during uh, a TLS and the shake. Uh, in our context, the top window is the, the attacker window, and the bottom window is the, the, the server window. So, first of all, what I'm going to do is to generate a new certificate for the, uh, for the server and the new private key. We use RSA 40,096 bits, so a strong key. Okay, now I'm going to run this other script that basically executes a TLS service by using the good version of OpenSSL. And after 11 seconds, this service is killed and it is run again, this time with the bad version of OpenSSL. And this could simulate the injection of uh, a faulty signature. Instead, on client side, we will use high voltage. 
And basically, we pass to this tool only to mandatory option, which are basically the IP address of server and the port of the service. Okay, so I'm running on server side TLS service and contemporary I run high voltage. And now the tools start to establish multiple TLS and the shades until a faulty signature is detected. And apparently there has been a faulty signature. And so apparently the private key of server has been recovered. To verify this, let's see, let's compare the two private keys. So the private key generated by the tool and the private key on server side. Okay. The name of the uh, server key is new one on server side. Okay, just compare, for example, the first three bytes here and here. If you can see, they are the same. And if you compare any other bytes, for example, we can go at the end of the key, oops, sorry, and also here at the end of the private exponent, you can see that also here and here we have a match. So basically the tool has been able to recover the private key of server. Okay, so this is a security bulletin from Dell. And uh, it is a security bulletin for one of their product, a uh, firewall solution which is called uh, Sonic Wall and was affected by this problem. And actually, they said that this attack required a highly sophisticated tool which is not available to the, the general public, but now it is for all of you. Okay, let's dig a little bit about the prerequisites of this attack. Uh, firstly, we say that we require a RSA signature which is calculating by using RSA CRT. As I told you, RSA CRT is uh, an optimization for, calcul for the calculation of digital signature. Because the exponentiation operation of RSA is computationally heavy, especially when we use the private key. And uh, uh, I personally don't know a single implementation, a single crypto library out there that is not using RSA CRT for the computational digital signature. So we can say that this uh, precondition is always satisfied. It no, is normally satisfied. So we require a faulty signature. And in the context of uh, this speech, we define a faulty signature with the letter Y. This is uh, uh, an unpredictable uh, situation, condition, so it is something that the attacker uh, cannot control, uh, but it is something that you can see very often, that happens very often in the embedded device world. If, if you think about uh, bit spotting attack, basically uh, uh, they are using the same principle. So sometimes there is some uh, bit flippings, it is due to CPU overheating, uh, to RAM error, stuff like that. And when, when this happens, actually a faulty signature is generated. So even if, if this condition is not, uh, uh, cannot be con controlled by the attacker, we can say that sooner or later it will happen. 
And the last precondition is that the signature must be calculated on uh, values the attacker known in plain text. This is very important. And we define the uh, value that must be signed with the letter hex for, uh, for the purposes of our talk. So basically, the digital signature is nothing more than a plain text value that is hashed, then uh, padded, and at the end, it is encrypted with the private key of the server. So from the, uh, each of these passages actually mutate and alter the shape of X. Uh, so from the plain text to the uh, hashed form, there is no problem until we know the hashing function that has been used to generate that hash. And it is something that the user knows just by observing the TLS protocol, the version of the TLS protocol used. But from the hashing function to the padded form, we could experience some problem because uh, the RSA standard defines some not deterministic way to generate padding, such as RSA PSS. But likely for the attacker, uh, from the version uh, of SSL 3.0 3 to up to TLS 1.2, actually the padding scheme used is fully deterministic. So it is not randomized, and it means that it is predictable. Uh, just to give you an example, let's assume that we have this hash, and it is our payload. This is our PKCS 1.5, which is the, um, the default padding scheme used with TLS. Actually, how PKCS uh, transform our payload. As you can see, the green byte 0001 is always prepended to the padding bytes. And uh, zero, 00, the black byte, is always appended at the end. And in the middle, there is a long, uh, more or less long series or, um, of, FFF, of FF bytes that basically are the padding. And this depends on the size, uh, sorry, on the length of the payload, because probably you have to know that the message that is padded must have the same length of the uh, key used to sign the, uh, the message. So as you can see, uh, it is quite predictable. It is not randomized. And this is uh, how PKCS 1.5 transform our payload when uh, TLS 1.0 and TLS 1.1 is negotiated, is used. For TLS 1.2, there is a slight difference. So basically, between the black byte and the uh, red part, the payload. Basically, it is appended the DER encoded form of the object identifier for the hashing algorithm used to generate this, this hash. So basically, there is the negotiation of the hash that is used to uh, generate uh, this, uh, this hash, basically. And uh, the most important part here is that the padding scheme is fully deterministic. So it is something that we can predict up front. And of course, we require the presence of a digital signature somewhere in the TLS and the shake. And this condition is always satisfied if we carefully negotiate the right cipher suite. For example, uh, let's see what happens when we negotiate the cipher suite. So basically, RSA here is used both for authentication and has a key exchange mechanism. AES is the symmetric algorithm, CBC the mode operation, and SHA is the hashing algorithm. So when the RSA private key is leaked in this context, not only the current session, but also all those one established in the past and the future with the same private key are compromised. And the certificate message, in this case, contain a signature. But the signature is generated with the private key of the certification authority or the private key of the server if we have a self-signed certificate. But this signature is actually statically embedded and not, and not dynamically generated. And we can say that this cyber suite is not good for our purposes. 
What if instead we use this kind of cyber suites? So actually, elliptic curve, diffeherman ephemeral, or diffeherman ephemeral only, is used as key exchange mechanism. Instead, RSA is only used for authentication. This is very important. The rest is the same and doesn't matter. So in this case, the key exchange is done by using some private and public key which are generated on the fly. And uh, this is very important because if the private key of a specific TLS session is compromised, in this case, only that session is compromised, not the previous one or the, uh, that one that are established in the future. And this feature is called perfect forward secrecy. And perfect forward secrecy actually fits perfectly to us because, because when we negotiate this kind of cyber suite, a dynamically generated signature is embedded inside the server key exchange message. And this message is only, only exchanged when perfect forward secrecy is uh, negotiated. So this is our high voltage, the tool that you have seen uh, previously, basically works. So uh, it sends a TLS cli client hello message by negotiating perfect forward secrecy cyber suites only. And uh, it takes note by uh, a 32-byte structure, which is called the random structure. The server answers with the TLS server hello packet. And in this, case, in this case as well, the tool takes note of the 32-byte uh, random structure. Afterward, the server sends the certificate. Two pieces of information are, are very important here. Hand, which is a big semi-prime number, and E, which is actually a small exponent, such as 3 or 65,537. Together, HAN and D represent the public key of server. And finally, the server transmit the TLS server uh, key exchange packet that actually contain a structure called uh, server parameters, which is very important for, for our attack. And also the tool takes note of the signature, which is embedded in this packet. And the signature is actually generated on these three pieces, calculated on these three pieces of information. And this is because the tools collect, the tool collects this is information, because these three pieces of information actually allow us to detect if the signature is valid or not. And as I told you previously, the presence of a faulty signature is very important. So how to detect a faulty signature? Just looking for them. For example, with uh, TLS 1.1 or TLS uh, 1.0, basically, the tools collect all the messages from the client tilo up to the server key exchange message by extracting the information that it needs. And uh, it creates actually two signage, sorry, two hashes, MD5 hash and the SHA1 hash, uh, giving as input the collected information. And these hashes are actually concatenated together. Next, the tools use the public key of uh, the server to decrypt the digital signature inside the server key exchange message. And from there, the padding is removed. And then the result is compared with the, thing, with the hashes that has been calculated offline. If there is a match, actually the signature is valid. If there is a mismatch, it, and it, it is, of course, the condition that the attacker want to happen. If there is a mismatch, actually it means that the signature is faulty. And the attack can continue by applying the original Lenstra attack of 20 years ago. With TLS 1.2, the procedure is basically the same. But instead of uh, generating the MD5 and SHA1 hash, actually the hashing algorithm used is specified inside the TLS server key exchange me uh, message. 
So now we have a faulty digital signature. How can we continue with the attack? We need to apply the Lenstra attack, as I, as I told you uh, previously. And to understand the specific attack, we need also to understand how RSA works and what is the RSA CRT optimi optimization. And finally, I, can, I will show you a second demo. So RSA is a very simple algorithm because every operation can, can be described in terms of multiplication, modulo, or uh, exponentiation operations. For example, these are the two formulas used for encryption and decryption. And basically here, in this context, C is the ciphertext, HAM is the message to encrypt, and HAND uh, represents the public key, while E is a little exponent, a small number, such as 3 or 65,537. HAND is instead a big semi-prime number, that is given by the multiplication of two prime numbers, P and Q. And the security of RSA rotates entirely the fact that P and Q are unknown to the attacker. D instead is the private key, which is generated by providing three pieces of information to the inverse modular function, which are P, Q, and E. So, by getting P and Q, we can calculate the uh, private key of server very easily because E is already a public information. So if you remember, I told you that actually the security of RSA rotated entirely the fact that the prime numbers P and Q are unknown to the attacker. But actually, it is even worse than this because if the attacker can collect just one of P and Q, he or she can actually derive the other prime number, and then the private key can be calculated very easily. So to understand this concept, just reason on a small number. For example, let's assume that uh, the, uh, the value of hand inside the certificate is 77, and for some reason, uh, the attacker was able to derive one of the prime factors of n and assume that in this case p is equals to 7. So we can derive the other prime factor q very easily just by dividing n by p. And, and if instead the attacker has q, knows the value of q, he can derive P very easily just by dividing hand by Q. And of course, Q multiplied P give us the value of N. So the RSA CRT optimization. RSA CRT is basically, as I told you, is an optimization that speeds up the calculation of digital of RSA digital signature. And basically the calculation of RSA is uh, broken down into small pieces. So if you want to sign something with RSA CRT, there are some values that are pre-computed and some other values that are generated, uh, that are calculated on the fly. And especially the calculation of S1 and S2 is very critical because if there is a fault during the calculation of one of these two uh, values, basically a faulty signature is generated. And a prime factor of n, a prime factor of the public key, can be derived, can be calculated by using the greatest common device, uh, device or function. And actually, it is the Lestra, oops, sorry. It is the Lestra memo, the Lestra attack of 1996. And the value that we need to feed this function are actually value that the attacker can, uh, can get very easily. Because Y, which is the faulty signature, can be extracted from the uh, TLS server key as change message. E, which is the public exponent, is, is found inside the certificate. Hex is the original 
hashed the, and the, it is the yes the original value that has been hashed and padded. And if you remember, PKCS yes, 1.5 is a padding scheme deterministic. And N is the public key of the server that can be also found inside the certificate. So they are all public information. So the attack exploited by the tool high voltage that I've created now should be uh, very clear because basically the tool established multiple uh, TLS and the shakes trying to detect a faulty signature. When a faulty signature is detected, the Lenstra attack uh, is, uh, is executed and this allows us to derive one of the prime factor of the public key, whatever, or P or Q, it doesn't matter. When we have one prime factor, actually we can derive the other one very easily, as I've shown you previously. And once you have both of P and Q, you can actually calculate the private key. And this is game over. So, as probably you may, uh, may have known, Basically, all these pieces of information, all the pieces of information that we need to, uh, um, to exploit the Lenstra attack are exchanged in clear text over the network. So this means that basically uh, we can just sniff the TLS traffic looking for the information that are useful to us and we can conduct this kind of attack not only actively but also passively sniffing the network. And to demonstrate this concept, I have created the second tool that I've called Picciolla. And uh, I want to give you a live demo of this other tool as well. So basically, Picciolla is composed by two components, a bash script and a C application program. And it works on traffic dump capture with uh, TCP dump or Wireshark. Basically, every traffic dump written inside the pickup file. So, what we are going to do, first of all, we have inside this directory uh, different uh, pickup files. First of all, we want to uncompress every TCP stream inside this pickup file. To do that, we use the TCP flow tools, or actually, we can use the script that make the job for us. So basically, now inside this directory, we have different TCP streams, and just we need just to execute Picciolla by passing the name of the directory containing all the uncompressed streams and actually start the elaboration. And at the end of this, uh, of the analysis of each TCP stream, basically different directory are created. For example, the incomplete directory contains uh, all the TCP streams where only the client payload was detected and not the, the server payload or vice versa. The not TLS directory contains all the TCP streams that actually are not referring to uh, uh, SSL or TLS uh, connection. The TLS not affected directory actually contains every TCP stream which is a TLS session but for which has not been possible uh, to derive the private key. Instead, the result directory is where uh, the private key leaked are written. So for each session, it is created uh, a random directory. And inside of this directory, we can find, we can find the stream files describing the communication between client and server. And of course, we can find the certificate, the public key, and the private key derived by high voltage. Sorry, by Picciolla. 
So what does it mean? It means, I repeat, that basically we can use this kind of attack actively, so by uh, establishing multiple TLS on the shake, or we can just sniff the, the traffic of our network. So it is a proof of concept. I mean, Picciola is a proof of concept, but you might use it to detect, for example, faulty signature by analyzing your network traffic damp. And uh, of course, to exploit this vulnerability, you require that uh, your application is linked to one of the uh, crypto libraries vulnerable. And there are plenty of those. This is just a brief list of crypto library that has been found vulnerable or for which the vendor declared to be vulnerable. Instead, regarding the hardware part, basically the affected devices are security devices such as firewall, VPN concentrator, and uh, UTM solutions, and th stuff like that, that is supposed to protect the boundaries of a company or the privacy, the privacy of the users. And these are, this is a brief list, not complete list of devices that are affected by the problem. And we have other vendors, other vendors affected as well. It is very difficult, especially when you try to, to scan the internet, to identify specifically uh, a version or a model of a vulnerable device, because sometimes the exact model or version is not specified inside the certificate. And inside the certificate, you can find, uh, I don't know, some generic uh, uh, indication for the vendor. And the last device that I have found vulnerable is in, uh, in June, actually, is this uh, surveillance camera from the link. So also surveillance camera and the printers are affected by this problem. The fix. Um, some crypto libraries allows the user to, to disable the CRT the RSA CRT optimization, but it is not suggestible, it is not advisable for, for, for performance reason. And uh, of course, if you have some, uh, if you are using a vulnerable library, you can compare the version of, the version that you are using with the list that I have uh, specified in the slides. So, now the question is, is only TLS affected by this problem? The question is no, because uh, how there a lot of protocols are using perfect forward secrecy and uh, RSA as algorithms. Um, and I believe that in this sense, we require much more research in future, I mean in this specific field, because there are some assumptions that are not revealing so true. For example, it is believed so far that it is not possible to derive uh, a private key from an, an IPsec session just by sniffing the traffic. So it is believed that you have to actively interact with uh, the Hike service. In fact, Hike, Hike version one is a, a really important part of the IPsec staff, uh, stack because allow the peers to negotiate authentication and the so-called so security associations. And actually, in the high version one, we can see that during a phase called phase one, where authentication and negotiation of security associations of the peer is done, uh, basically, two modes are supported by high version one, which are the main mode and the aggressive mode. Both of these modes actually support a so-called RSA signature authentication, which is based on digital certificate. And this is what happens when the main mode in Hike version one is used. As you can see on packet number five, basically the initiator, which is the attacker, must to send a certificate and its signature. And this means that the attacker requires a valid certificate if you want to continue uh, in the handshake, because if 
it provides uh, a bad certificate, actually the server should drop the connection or should discard the connection. And another problem is that the server transmits the certificate and its signature only on packet six, which is actually exchanged inside an encrypted channel. So this is because this is of, because of the assumption that you need to be an active uh, uh, attacker in order to uh, derive the private key. But what happens if we instead use the aggressive mode on IK with Ike version, version one? So basically, the certificate and the signature of server is used on packet number two. So it is used in the very preliminary phase of the handshake. And this exchange happened inside a clear text channel, basically. So if we use IK version one in aggressive mode with a digital signature, with signature authentication, basically, if all the preconditions are met in just two packets, we can derive the private key of the server. Uh, let me conclude with some special thanks to my colleague Frank Bosman that I provi has provided the nice drawings that you have seen so far. And of course, Florian Weimer for his pioneering research. And also, if you, if you want to visit Sicily, please let me know, especially the green and the yellow part. If you do that, uh, I will offer you a drink. And uh, if you have any question, I'm here. I just want to tell you last thing. So this year, uh, every talk of, uh, at uh, Black Hat is evaluated, so you should have received an email. And if you enjoyed my talk, and uh, if you like to give a good uh, evaluation to my talk, I would really appreciate you for that. I have concluded. Thank you.